Good afternoon. Good afternoon. It's Monday, the 25th of November. My name is Sidan Vikramasinghe, and I'm the head of research for Maybank Securities. And welcome to another edition of Monday Market Picks. Can't believe November is on its final legs and we are entering December. I don't know where this year has gone. Uh, well, for this week, it's going to be a very data heavy week. We've got inflation readings coming out from the US, from Singapore, the EU and Japan as well. So the markets will be watching for this as well as trying to get some clues as to which direction rates will go. We actually have rate decisions coming from quite a few central banks as well, including uh, New Zealand as well as South Korea. So how do we position uh, for Singapore this week? Where are the opportunities? Well, for one, it's going to be the economy. Um, I think we've got some very strong third quarter GDP readings, uh, and we've got uh, Dr. Hagbin Chua joining us, uh, our regional co-head of economics, to talk to us about what this means and where uh, forecasts can go for this year as well as next year. Um, and then we turn our attention to equities, uh, where one of the most promising themes for this year, as well as for most of last year, has been GLC restructuring. And Jarek Seat thinks that he's found another candidate who fits this bill. So he's coming on uh, line to talk to us about a new initiation that has about 40% upside. Uh, and then uh, with our latest GDP readings, giving some hope to manufacturing um, we revisit our buy call on Franken as well. Uh, and then we actually have ST Engineering, uh, which has just been downgraded by Krishna to a hold. We'll dive deep into why that is. And then as always, we've got Amirul, our chart guy, with some very interesting trading buy and a trading sell idea as well. So a lot to go through, so do stay with us. Uh, but first, let's uh, turn our attention to Hagbin. Uh, on the Singapore economy. Hagwin, welcome to the show. Hey, hi, hi, Talan. Hi. So, Hagwin, mm. uh, Singapore's third quarter GDP grew by about 5.4%, which actually exceeded the MTI's uh, flash estimates as well as our own forecast. Now, what's behind this performance? Hey, hi, Talan. Yeah, so it was a big, uh, um, big jump. And um, part of it came from the manufacturing side. Manufacturing growth was actually upgraded to 11% in the third quarter. That's a big turnaround from the contraction of minus 1.1% in the second quarter. So that led to a remarkable surge. At the same time, services growth as well, you know, seem to have picked up slightly. Um, so services mm. growth picked up to 4%. You know, initial um, advance estimates was uh, slightly lower than that, 3.3%. And again, I guess some of the components uh, yeah, surprised us. One was transport and storage. That's up 7.5%, in particular boosted by very strong air cargo volumes, you know, that, which was uh, up 13.5%. Uh, passenger arrivals at Changyu also pretty strong, above 10%. Uh, wholesale trade as well, you know, which is correlated with the regional trade volumes, uh, held up pretty well. That's 4.9%. And um, as well as accommodation, you know, uh, again, uh, rising number of visitor arrivals to Singapore, pretty strong. So that came in at 3.7%, uh, pretty resilient, actually slightly better than the second quarter. So all in all, it looks like a pretty, pretty good growth going into the third quarter, which is why the MTI you know, upgraded the forecast for this year to 3.5%, uh, previously from their 2 to 3%. Uh, we had it already at 35 we're looking at 3.6% now uh, for, for this year. Right, right. So, uh, I mean, when I see it's uh, when I see the numbers, fairly broad-based growth. But as you pointed out, manufacturing has had a very strong sort of revival. So, do you think this revival has legs, and what sort of uh, headwinds do you see going forward? Some of the more recent PM nine numbers have been um, cooling off from that from their top. So, I think there are some uh, risks that well, with Trump coming in, that some of the you know electronics demand as well as the if he does raise trade barriers, you know, in, a, in the first half of the year, particularly on China, that could, uh, you know, that could disrupt trade. So I think we're watchful on that. Uh, on, on that, yeah. I mean, it's kind of ironic because manufacturing surged so dramatically, but actually, um, MTI actually downgraded the export forecast, right, to just around 1%. So there is this uh, bit of a discrepancy though, between what, how exports are doing and compared to how manufacturing is doing, you know. Um, so part of it is reconciled, I think, from the biomedical side, but uh, you know, on, on export side, electronics doesn't seem to be doing as well as uh, 
as a manufacturing side. So we're just assuming that some of them, some orders are being produced will eventually that show up hopefully on the export numbers as well. Got it, got it. Now you mentioned that you uh, upgraded uh, the 2024 GDP to 3.6% from 3.5%. Um, how are you kind of seeing uh, 2025? Uh, where do you think G GDP will land for 2025? Right. So the government is starting 2025 with a 1% to 3% forecast range, you know, and I guess they've, uh, they've highlighted in their guidance that the downside risk remains uh, considerable, considerable you know, given the uncertainty, especially with Trump coming in. Uh, we are putting it around 2.6%. So I think there's you know, enough uh, momentum in sort of data, especially on the services side, that we think can sustain growth going into, uh, into, the, into next year. You know? um, I think uh, one of the couple of numbers that kind of stand out for us is construction. You know, construction is roughly about 3 to 4% this year. But the construction orders is uh, jumping like 55% in the third quarter. So that's a big surge in both the public sector contracts as well as the private contracts. Part of it comes from the kickstarting of some of the mega big projects in Singapore, uh, particularly the 10 billion, um, you know, Sangi Airport Terminal 5 projects. So that's one as well as some integrated resorts, uh, you know, with, you know some, of this, some of this expansions of the new amenities and all that were kind of delayed and that's going to kick off in, in next year as well. At the same time, the HDB, you know, there's been a lot of launches, so that's uh, going full steam. Uh, and then at the same time, more recently, a lot of the sales for the private residential projects have really uh, picked up quite a bit, you know, in the last few months. So it looks like construction should be steaming ahead um, and, you know, could come in, you know, maybe, maybe even double the rates that we saw uh, uh, this year. You know? uh, so we're looking at construction growth probably in the six to 8% uh, next year. Uh, and then, uh, of course, we're also thinking that uh, yeah, monitoring easing will continue with the Fed likely to continue to cut rates, though the, the rate cuts could be shallower compared to what it was you know, before the Trump election win. And with rate, interest rates already falling in Singapore uh, by quite a bit, that could help the yeah, lift lending activity as well as the property market. So, so I think 2.6% uh, uh, is a reasonable forecast going to going to the year with both a balance of upside and downside risk. Clearly, the downside risk is uh, Trump hits the tariff early on, uh, hitting trade on China, but also whether he can he will introduce the blanket tariffs that is threatened with. Uh, we think that he can hit the China tariffs quite early because he can just use the same uh, clause, the Section Three Zero One. But I think pushing <laughs> with a blanket tariffs will involve a much longer due process uh, and can't use the same, you know, same um, same uh, legislation that you did for the China tariffs, you know, to, to push that through. Right. Okay. So very quickly, um, what do you think the MAS will do? Will they will mm. they ease in Jan or hold? I think certainly the very strong growth surge kind of takes away the odds of an easing in January. And um, I guess we're just watching for the inflation numbers that come out later today at 1 p.m., to see that uh, if core inflation does come down, maybe the easing move is still uh, on the table for January. Bear in mind that the core inflation has been rather sticky in the last few months. It actually jumped, you know, kind of climbed up back to about 2.8%, uh, you know, from a recent low, 2.5%. But the MAS keeps on guiding in the recent uh, you know, statements and briefings that, uh, that the inflation could come down to about 2% by year end. So we'll see. We'll see what happens today. If uh, if inflation is kind of sticky, we probably will think that MS will have to delay any kind of easing uh, to the April or July meeting. Uh, the so yeah, so we'll, we'll watch for that. Got it. So let's watch for that at one p.m. today. Uh, thanks, Hagwin. That was Hagwin, our co uh, head of regional economics, joining us. Now. Uh, a major theme in Singapore, as I said earlier, on the equity side, um, that has been driving quite a few stocks, uh, the large cap stocks, uh, has been uh, GLC restructuring so that they can uh, be uh, much more efficient as well as drive more return on invested capital for shareholders. Uh, Jarek uh, has, uh, he thinks he's found the next uh, restructuring candidate with Singh Post which he has initiated today uh, with a buy, and the stock uh, has nearly 40% upside for his target price. Now, Jarek, uh, while most investors 
no Singh post very well. There has been some movements in terms of the capital structure and stuff like that uh, recently. So maybe let's start with catching us up on uh, the company. Hi, Dylan. Yeah, sure. So actually, Singapore, Singapore Post is not really Singapore Post now. Majority of its earnings are actually from Australia. So they are actually more of Australian Post instead. But if you take a look now, I mean, the management has came in four or five years ago, four years ago, and they have actually grown the Australia business to now they are the fourth largest logistics and postal player in Australia. Uh, Singapore business is more of like uh, slight losses because of, I mean, end of the day, how many of us actually goes to the post office now to post something, right? It's, we are, it's getting mm. less and less, and this business is not actually sustainable. So what is happening to Sing Post is that they are growing the, the Australia business. They have did a, quite a few acquisitions, and now they are the fourth largest in Australia. Uh, it, Australia contributes to more than half of its uh, profits, and then the other half is actually 40% uh, of it is from Sing Post Centre, and then another 10% is from the international and the freight forwarding business. So basically now Sing Post, uh, and also what has happened is that management now has also you know uh, followed the other GLC com uh, other GLC companies and they are looking to sort of uh, monetize their assets, non-core assets, and return some value to shareholders. So if you look at uh, Sing Post in general, uh, they have a lot of assets that they own, like Sing Post Center, the Oshila business, the freight forwarding business, as well as all the post offices. Uh, they have totally about forty post offices in Singapore, and all of that. 20 of them are owned at 30, 30 years lease or more. So these assets are like, you know, the, the most notable ones would be at Kilini, KPO, uh, the, the one year uh, tanks as well. So these are the more notable ones. And, and we do believe that, you know, all these assets add up to uh, a lot more than the market cap and their enterprise value. So we do think that uh, Singapore is actually quite undervalued on that front. Right. So, so tell us uh, uh, what's kind of driving your initiation by? What are the key sort of components that investors should be taking note of? Yeah, so I think following the likes of your Singtel, Semcorp Industries, as well as your Capital Corp, I think the management have also shown that they are actually really taking steps to monetize their assets. First would be Famous Holdings, which is the freight forwarding business. They have actually declared in briefings that they are, they have, and since the start of the year, that they are looking to sell this business. Uh, I think that uh, it should be concluding soon by the end of the year. Uh, they have also mentioned that it should be uh, done by the end of the year and that one should generate about 80 million to 100 million of sales proceeds for, 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 for Singapore, Post, Singapore Post. The next would be the Australian business. I think we have seen in articles, in uh, many articles from Australia as well as in uh, the Singapore Press that you know there's a lot of bidders, the PE funds, they are, they are bidding up to about 1B for this business. We also value the business at around 1B, which is about 12 times EB, uh, EBITDA. So basically, uh, from what we understand, they're looking to sell a certain stake, uh, a minority stake, but, and they want to retain control. But you know, if the price is better for someone who wants a, a majority stake, then they will sell 100% of the business. So it really depends on what's the best price they can get for shareholders. And uh, you know, if they were to sell 100%, we estimate it to bring about 1B together with that trade forwarding company 1.1B for back to shareholders, which is quite substantial. If you look at the Singapore's market cap plus enterprise value plus their debt, net debt is only about 1.8 to 1.9B. So, so basically, this really covers more than half of it. And then there is still also Singapore Center. Singapore Center is fully paid up. It's currently valued on their books at 1B, uh, 1 to 1.1B. So basically, that is another one that we do think that uh, will likely be monetized after conclusion with the, the Singapore government, which will also be by the end of this year. So they are currently talking to the Singapore government to conclude, uh, to rationalize some of their the postal business because it's not sustainable to have so many outlets. Uh, and with the volumes coming down, uh, it's, uh, they are looking to reduce more than half of the postal offices. So with that, if the government agrees, they can actually sell some of this, uh, half of this uh, the 10, uh, 40 outlets that they own, or actually convert them to be used for other uh, like commercial use or other industrial use. And that mm -hmm. will help them to generate income rather than uh, making a loss at these post offices. Right. So how much value do you think uh, Singpost can unlock if, if they continue to do all these things uh, versus where the share price is today? So assuming they sell everything and assuming our assumption is our SOTP is based on uh, their post offices at cost, uh, but the rest will be a market value. Uh, we value our SOTP ar arise at about 86 cents a share uh, after you minus off that. 
Uh, so, so we do think that it's six cents a share, but we do our, our target price is based on the conservative fifteen percent holding co discount, which is at seventy four cents. But I mean, if they sell everything and return cash to shareholders in the next two years, then you'll get back likely eighty six cents a share or more. Right. Um, I think uh, an interesting thing to note is if you actually look at some of the past GLC restructurings, uh, they have generally returned between what 15 to 180 percent uh, returns to shareholders. So that's something to watch out for in Singtel as well. Now, uh, uh, Jarek, final question. Uh, what are some of the risks, do you think, to your thesis at this stage? Sure. So I think the risk would be more of an economic recession. It depends on whether, uh, firstly, the Australian business can continue to grow and whether the postal business was slow because a lot of the Logistic business is based on e-commerce and if spending slows down, then the volumes will slow down. So that is one of the key risks. The second key risk would be also FX risk because now they are getting a lot of uh, revenue from Australia. So if Australian dollar weaken, it will also probably uh, hit the impact for Singapore. And uh, lastly, I would say that the most important key risk would be that the asset monetization prices are not... Uh, are not in line with what we expect or the market expects. So let's say if they are lower, then there might be a disappointment uh, on the share price. But other than that, we do think that uh, the upside is more than the downside. And we do think that with the in impending cap uh, catalyst coming through, uh, and if you look at the past examples, for example, like you mentioned, you know, uh, Capital Corp, Semcorp Industries and Singtel, they have all risen from 15, uh, up to 15% to 150% since they announced and actually monetize certain of their assets and return value to shareholders. So we do that, to, you know, with uh, the deep value that Singapore have, we do think that the upside upside is actually quite significant. Got it. Uh, Jarek, while uh, you're here, uh, just very quickly on Frank and, you know, Hugbin mentioned uh, some positive moves in terms of the manufacturing side and things like that. So within that context, uh, how are you thinking about Frank and now? I know that's the only buy you have in the tech manufacturing uh, sector. So uh, how, how are you thinking about this stock right now? Okay, I mean, Franklin is still growing well with key customers, especially in the semicon segment. So they are still growing well with AMAC. They're getting more market share and new MPIs. Uh, ASML is still is also likely to shift production from Europe to Singapore and Malaysia. And we, think, we do think that Franklin will benefit from that. And they are, already sh they are already shifting some of these modules to Singapore as we speak. But the only, I mean... Franken, if you look at it, this year they are up they are, as of nine months, they are growing about 49% profits year on year, while the rest are AEM and UMS are actually having a profit decline. So that's why we still like Franken. Uh, I mean, currently the sector is not in favor. The sector is quite weak. So across the board, I mean, you will see share prices quite muted uh, if, uh, and also underperform. Uh, but for Franken, we do think that the outlook is still better as compared to the other two. Uh, if there's any pickup in the semicon segment, especially in the second half of next year, which we expect there to be some, then Franklin will likely be the main beneficiary. Uh, but for now, the market remains weak, but we do believe in Franklin's management and fundamentals. That's why we still maintain a buy on Franklin, but we have a sell on AEM and a hold on uh, UMS. Got it. So could be an early beneficiary once the tech, uh, tech manufacturing sector turns around. Thanks, Jerry. Now, let's, uh, with that, let's turn to Amirul, our chart guy. He's here uh, with us today. Uh, Amirul, welcome to the show. Um, and uh, I know you got two ideas. What are they today, Amirul? Hi, hi, Till, and thanks for having me on the show. So let me share my screen first. Right, so first, we have a buy call on Ying Zijiang Chimp building. So... The main reason why I recommended this stock is because of this move over here. Even though it looks like the stock is making a sideways move from this uh, July high to November 2024. But then this move over here, if you could see, the previous four session has made like a gap up move. So if you look at the three candles over here, it has actually made a gap up move with significantly higher than average volume. And if you look at the current um, candle over here, which was this morning's candle, it also made another gap up move with a strong volume. So I believe now bulls have the upper advantage. Uh, now it's also trading above all key moving averages. So I believe uh, given the upward trending in the RSI and also uh, the upward trending in the DI positive, so given the four consecutive uh, gap up uh, trading volume, 
I believe it could uh, test our next resistance at 2.90 before it builds a new consolidation. So this seems like a good buy. Also because it's also about to take uh, up the current resistance level. So if I draw a line up there and I draw another line down here, it is about to make an ascending triangle pattern breakout. So I believe it if it could make a breakout above this pattern, this would be a sign of a bullish continuation. And next, we have a sell call on wind tie. So for wind tie, it has actually been in a downtrend ever since in uh, April 2024 high. But then uh, now the stock is now trading above all key moving averages. And if you look at all key moving average, it has been sloping downwards, which means uh, bears now have uh, the upper hand. And even so, the current candle is making a green candle, which is a uh, buying interest uh, for this stock. But I believe this buying interest is temporary and this might be a bull trap. So cautious to all investors out there. So for me, if you really want to get into a uh, wind tie again, since it has been in a bulls uh, rally uh, in February, 2024, it has to be at least back above the 200 DSMA, which is the purple line over here which is currently around $1.36 uh, dollar, Singapore dollar. So cautious to all investors out there. So that's all from me, Tillian, uh, and happy trading, everyone. Thanks, Amiral. Now, let's quickly move on to one of our other key, recommend key buy recommendations this year. That was uh, ST Engineering. Uh, Krishna just downgraded it to hold uh, after about a 15% run this year. Uh, he is concerned about the order book, which actually saw a dip in the third quarter. Uh, while most of this was due to FX, uh, it's still something to watch out for. Uh, the defense business continues to do well, uh, looking at the third quarter results, and the aircraft MRO business, which is the maintenance, uh, repair, and overhaul business, that's also doing well. Uh, but the urban solutions and SATCOM's business is taking longer than expected uh, to turn around, and this may be a drag on future earnings. Uh, while we see ST Engineering is executing pretty well, uh, without a sizable order book, that's going to hit a bit of margins as we go forward. Uh, so we'll wait for a better entry point on this stock uh, once we have a bit of uh, much better clarity in terms of the order book. So uh, watch for that new whole recommendation. Uh, with that, we've got a few events that are coming up. Uh, we've got, uh, as I said, very data heavy week. We've got industrial production out uh, uh, today. Uh, we've got uh, inflation also out today, bank lending out on the 29th uh, of this month, and the PMI readings coming out on the 4th of November, and the unemployment rate uh, coming out on the 12th of, uh, sorry, 13th of December. And we also have uh, quite a few uh, year-ending events as well. Uh, tomorrow, the 26th, we actually have uh, uh, event to look at US stocks and how to get exposure to them using daily leverage certificates. So anyone who's interested in trading the US, uh, this is a very uh, interesting seminar to uh, join. You can do that by, sc by scanning the QR code here. With that, we are out of time. Uh, do join us next week. We have a very special announcement for a uh, for for a new uh, Market Mondays that, that is coming out uh, with some very special guests uh, over, ne over the next couple of weeks. So do join us next week where, where we will tell you what that is. Uh, with that, have a profitable trading week and see you next week.